Hi, welcome to another episode of Zelf on the Shelf. How's everyone doing today? Got your little morning coffee or no? Your Dwayne the Rock Johnson energy drink. Your morning quaaludes. <laughs> That's a joke from Stephanie Chapter One, which just went live on our Patreon. We're doing another Jack Wayland book. Uh, Jack Wayland is, of course, the author of the famous book Charlie, which was adapted into uh, LDS film. And we've read several of his books. <laughs> and that's why we made these mugs for our Etsy that say number two mum on them. It's an inside joke from the Adam series, which we just did on Patreon. So it really is our best content, which is why it lives on it's Patreon. It's our best content. It's a fun time. Though. But we have been slowly releasing the Sam episodes publicly on YouTube. They're about a year old now, but they're just so good. We had to release them. So we have been releasing those. So. But yeah, if you, uh, for like a dollar is the minimum amount you can pay on Patreon to access A dollar, that. ten, it's totally up to A hundred, whatever you feel like. <laughs> 10, 000, yeah, you can also become a channel member and we put them there too, but I think we uh, get more of the money through Patreon than channel memberships, not sure. Anyway, what are we doing today, Tana? You've prepared this video. Today we're talking about the word of wisdom. I can't believe we haven't done like a coffee video or a word of wisdom video. We did the Mormon enforcement one, but we haven't done yes, like a uh, Mormon enforcement. Bring Mormon back Mormon history. enforcement. <laughs> coffee is just, so funny because like of all the things listed on there it's probably the most innocuous and the most like actively you know, healthy yeah so for those of you who may not know the word of wisdom was a revelation given to joseph smith the prophet the founding prophet of mormonism back in the 1800s um, that was not a commandment per se it was more like some friendly advice from god about how to live healthily. And he specifically said, I give you this advice not by way of commandments. That's how we know it's that. It's right there in the header. He said it, <laughs> not us. Now, uh, what most people, most members don't know is there is a little bit of controversy surrounding the coming forth of this uh, principle. David Whitmer, one of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon and top leaders in the church, said that the word of wisdom kind of started out as a joke. It wasn't mm. supposed to be real. It was, you know, the, the brethren were getting together and they're smoking and chewing tobacco and spitting on the floor and Emma, the woman, has to clean it up. And so she kept remarking like, wouldn't it be great if we got a revelation saying tobacco is bad? Mm. And then the men kind of jeered back and was like, well, if tobacco is bad, then you're not allowed to drink tea or coffee because... The drinks, tea was sort of seen as a woman's drink. Mm, I bet it was. So it was like, well, if we have to give up a thing, you have to give up a thing. And then, of course, Joseph Smith goes into trance mode and he gets the word of wisdom, which doesn't explicitly mention coffee <clears throat> or tea. It just says hot drinks. And LDS people like to believe that Joseph Smith was so ahead of his time on knowing that alcohol and Smoking was bad for you. <laughs> they don't They don't really address the whole tea and coffee thing because now we know that both of those drinks have a lot of health benefits. But it wasn't true that they were ahead of their time, right? I mean, it was right. <laughs> pretty common for people back then to be vilifying alcohol and... And tobacco. I mean, as early as, uh, what, like 1609 or something, the King of Scotland published a treatise against tobacco. <laughs> so, like, hundreds mm. of years before Joseph Smith, this was, like, a mainstream talking point. And, of course, this is a great example of Mormon exceptionalism where they're like, this, nothing was happening. Like, there was no revelation. Everybody was lost and confused. It was dark ages. And then Joseph Smith, out of nowhere, opened the heavens open and had all these new ideas that he gave the world. And it's like, actually, he was part of the Second Great Awakening, which was focused primarily in upstate New York. And as part of the overall temperance movement that was happening in the country and in the world at the time, uh, this wasn't just something from nothing. It was definitely mm -hmm. in the circuit, as it were, a, a major talking point. Kind of like how the plot of the Book of Mormon and the uh, attitudes about Native Americans in that book were also being circulated in Joseph's area in Joseph's time. He didn't just come up with it out of the blue. You can always see Joseph Smith's influences clear as day. Totally. I mean, look at like the Seventh-day Adventist church, which was founded in like 1840 or something in upstate New York yeah, really by close. a prophet, Ellen White, who had visions of Jesus. <laughs> and uh, they also don't drink coffee or meat. And they're actually very strict about the meat. They're strong vegetarians, but yeah. they don't drink coffee either. Interesting that both Joseph Smith and Ellen White said 
meat isn't good, mm. but the Mormons just were like, that one's too hard. We're actually not going to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, the word of wisdom says Mormons should only eat meat in winter or times of famine, AKA when it's absolutely necessary, mm-hmm. which aligns with my views as a vegan. You know, mm. it's like if I was in famine, yeah, sure. <laughs> or if someone like, offered it to me and I wasn't buying it, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do we want to read the word of wisdom? Oh, God. <laughs> we could we could. Do kind we of, have to? Can we just like we bring can, up the hits? We can go. Oh, yeah, well, let's do the hits. So again, it starts with benefit of the council to be sent by greeting, not by commandment or constraint, mm-hmm. given for a principle with promise adapted to the capacity of the weak and the weakest of all saints. Yeah, so in the Word of Wisdom, and we would hear this a lot at BYU, Idaho, and just in the church, there's kind of this idea that, well, everyone might not need to live these standards to, you know, not become addicted to something or to become unhealthy, but because there are always going to be weak people among us who will really struggle with any intake of those things, everyone has to kind of follow these. Well, I mean, it wasn't that strict when this was given, was it? So alcohol is the first thing that's mentioned in the word of wisdom. He says that in as, in as much as any man drinketh wine or strong drink among, among you, behold, it is not good, neither meet in the sight of your father, only in assembling yourselves together to offer up your sacraments. Oh, so you were still allowed wine for the sacrament back in the day? Yes. Mormons drink, uh, and I should specify Latter-day Saint Mormons, <laughs> drink uh, water in lieu of wine. That was a change that was made um, during Prohibition, which uh, is really when the church became hardliners on this with Heber J. Grant and Joseph Fielding Smith. Prior to that, they had, they had drank sacramental wine. And it's so funny now because... Uh, Mormons have to be so revisionist about everything because Mm -hmm. they're not allowed to drink wine, even in sacrament, even though it says in the official revelation, and there has not been given a revelation of word of God revelation since that has contradicted contradicted it. They've only, you know, changed it through councils and voting and all that. And there's kind of the general attitude, I think, among Mormons that, like, at a certain point, the prophets did get more revelations, and that's why it's now... We're just not privy to them. That's why now it's fine to eat meat, and, you know, the hot drinks thing doesn't apply to hot chocolate, and all these ways that the word of wisdom is just so arbitrary and people don't follow it. Uh The Mormons are like, well, you know, some prophet at some point must have just got a revelation because he wouldn't lead us astray. And it's worse than just being like, oh, that probably happened. What they did is actually went back in the past and changed things. So if you look in the history of the church, um, the original entries versus the revised version, um, I just grabbed a couple here. In one instance, Joseph Smith asked Brother Markham to get a pipe and and some tobacco for the Apostle Willard Richards. And the church changed the words and replaced pipe and tobacco with medicine. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> they sound like me when I'm talking about around around my Mormon family. <laughs> like, I, Mama needs her medicine. Do we... Sorry if you can hear the ambulance. Do we have an idea of when these kinds of changes were made? Um... I forget the exact, um, because the editing has gone, Brigham Young definitely made some edits, did like a wide sweeping purge and (laughs) reformation of information, but Brigham Young was not a hardliner about the word of wisdom, Um, and there have been subsequent changes, and and I'm not sure exactly when when those happened. Also, sorry if I'm jumping all over the place, but it's also worth talking about how the word of wisdom doesn't forbid Mormons from drinking all alcohol, it just talks about strong drink. But it says mild barley drinks, beer. Was yeah, it fine, says mi- right? yeah, uh, mild drinks is a lot. Mild barley drinks. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and which would have meant beer, right? Yeah, and uh, there l- it later became a big debate about it um, because do you know the Salt Air out by the Great Salt Lake? What about it? It used to be a church-owned amusement park, like from way back in the day, and they had a saloon in it, and there was a big debate among the apostles because the church was selling beer in it Mm. and uh, some of the apostles wanted to get rid of the saloon Uh, others wanted to keep it others wanted to have only danish beer because you couldn't get totally drunk on danish beer where american beer was stronger so it was a big a big debate that was eventually settled by uh through the death of i think lorenzo snow and then heber j grant being a strong prohibitionist and saying no more for anyone. No drink for you. I don't know if this was remotely relevant to Joseph's time in area, but I heard that in the in the past, in England at least, water was often so contaminated that everyone just lived on beer. Like, that was how they stayed hydrated, and people were just kind of mildly buzzed 
all day every day because the only water they would drink was beer. It would be a really weak beer compared to what we think of as beer now, maybe like 1%, I don't know, but mm. interesting fact. I've heard apologists say a similar thing about wine in Jesus's time. Like Great the only juice. reason that Jesus drank wine is because mm-hmm. water wasn't pure and was like... Well, then why eh. was it a big deal that he hung out with wine bibbers? <laughs> they called him a wine bibber because yeah. he drank too much. Yeah. That's, the, that's the interesting highlight of this whole thing is like the life cycle of an organization, it always gets overtaken by the managers mm-hmm. who are you know obsessed with everyone abiding by rules and creating extra rules so that you don't risk breaking the main rule. And Why they'll, true energy. They'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll use metaphors like, you know, you don't want to drive so close to the edge mm-hmm. of the road. You want to drive as far away as you can from it. But it's like... Yeah, maybe when you're driving, but you're creating arbitrary rules that don't matter. Like the, like the Pharisees who were like, you don't want to break that, so we have to create all these other things. And that's what Jesus was constantly harping on about. And now, even though the word of wisdom was given not by way of commandment, you can't attend your family member's wedding if you drank coffee because you won't be worthy of a temple recommend. Or if you had a glass of wine like Jesus Christ did every single day of his life, which he encouraged you to do in remembrance of him. Or um, wasn't Joseph Smith drinking right before he died? Oh yeah, that's a... That, that's so exactly where I was hoping we would go with this is, and this is uh, something to be aware of, like in the bite model, when we're talking about cults, one of the predominant facets of any cult-like organization is that there are different rules for the leaders and the membership. So on the one hand, we have Joseph Smith offering the word of wisdom as, you know, uh, an invitation and not a commandment, but very quickly it became a sort of expectation Um, So much so that Joseph Smith himself said, no official member in this church is worthy to hold an office after having the word of wisdom properly taught him. Oh. And he, the official member, neglecting to comply with and obey it. That is very hypocritical. Because he himself was constantly drinking beer, and and there are more examples of the history of the church being edited to remove uh, mentions of him having a beer Mm. with brother so-and-so. In fact, Joseph Smith and all the people in Carthage jail had wine the day that he died. Mm. And I guess it was a pretty chill prison. Yeah, fun jail. Because they shared the they shared the wine with the guards, so apparently there was some kind of rapport. I mean, Joseph did have that kind of charisma. We... Oh, yeah, he did just open up a bottle with the bros, even yeah. if they're, regardless of which side of the cell they're Definitely. on. Also, he's a fucking liar all the time. Like, around <laughs> this time, he had a bunch of wives and was saying, I've got only one wife. So it's, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a little liar all the time. Cannot be overstated. It's something that gets mentioned in some of the historical evaluations of the Word of Wisdom I was looking at, is that... Uh, Frequently, members were excommunicated or excommunicated or called to repentance for breaking the word of wisdom. Oh, even but under Joseph not, Smith, they were. Yep. Oh, even that was given not by way of commandment. Yep. Joseph but not for just... fornication. Oh, yeah. So riddle me that. Classic. Classic. <laughs> though sometimes they were. I bet if also a woman was found in adultery, though. Oh, yeah. No, oh, yeah. yeah, get rid of her. <laughs> That's when you need a javelin, you know? Definitely. <laughs> so, yeah, the Mormons don't drink wine now, even though it, it's. I had said this to you earlier, but like. The removal of wine from the sacrament and replacing it with water seems like a perfect metaphor for me for the watering down of Christianity and Mm. genuine spirituality that is Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Because wine really is a heart Mm. opener. Like, and again, it's not for everybody. People, some people just should not drink alcohol. And it could be, a case could be made that alcohol at any level is unsafe for you. It has negative consequences for your body. That being said, you can drink low amounts and not have it have a catastrophic amount. And some of the benefits, you know, it's a there's a, a cost benefit analysis that each person has to do for themselves. In the same way that, you know, you don't ever really need to eat a Twinkie and but if you have a Twinkie once in a while, you'll be fine. If you have a Twinkie shared among friends and it creates like a positive social bonding experience, then it's like, that's, you know, as long as you're not doing it too frequently or in excess, then the benefits probably will outweigh the negatives. Catch but, me in the group chat later. Y'all want to bond over a Twinkie? <laughs> Twinkie bonding time. We're not being um, naive. Obviously, the research does seem to show that there's pretty much no amount of drinking that comes without risk. Mm-hmm. In the same way that there's not really an amount of refined sugar or processed meat or, you know, other things that Mormons are fine with consuming that don't come without risk. Even exposure to the sun is, you know... There's Living in Salt Lake City. <laughs> That's the thing is Mormons have such a black and white view of things when it's like, uh, moderation really should be and is sort of mm-hmm. the spirit of the law here. Yeah. That gets totally overlooked. It's like an excess of anything is going to be bad for you. Yes. Too much of anything is bad. And some of the things that are bad in a little bit 
can have benefits that make life worth living. Kind of like how Brigham Young said. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if a person is weary, worn out, cast down, fainting, or dying, a brandy sling, a so little wine, fair. or a so cup of tea true. is a good to revive them. Do not throw these things away and say they must never be used. Totally. They are good to be used with judgment, prudence, and discretion. Ask our bishops if they d- drink tea every day, and in most cases, they will tell you they do if they can get it. Mm. One of the few times I happen to agree with Brigham Young. <laughs> the brandy is disgusting. <laughs> Funny, too, that, uh, you know, these men who... So Brigham Young says this at the same time, uh, the first... Actually, the first time that coffee was explicitly voted on as a... Do you hereby swear that you shall no longer partake of coffee was a meeting with Brigham Young and all the Relief Society sisters. Mm. So it was to them specifically where he was like, are you going to promise to give up Mm. coffee and tea, you sisters who are always complaining about everything? So, you know, he contains multitudes, Brother Brigham. (laughs) (laughs) And maybe this is the thing we'll get onto later, but um, it makes sense that these kind of arbitrary standards would be imposed on, let's say, the women, because the men had also had them. Because you, in high-control groups, in high-demand religions and cults, you have to... There's almost no high demand religion and cult that doesn't impose some kind of restriction on what people can eat and drink. That that seems to generally be the case, you know? Mm-hmm. And sex. Yes, of course sex. <laughs> you can't just let people mm-hmm. be having a good time mm-hmm. uh, following their own conscience. That's a little too much to ask. So oh, I was going to say it's interesting that with the like do as I say, not as I do attitude of the leaders you have on the one hand them preaching... On one, they have many hands, actually. On one hand, saying it's not a commandment. On the other hand, saying, but if you do it, you could get excommunicated or punished or otherwise mm-hmm. publicly censured. And then on the other hand, they all have businesses <laughs> that are uh, profiting. So like Joseph Smith in the Nauvoo house had a bar until... Emma said, it's either me and the kids or the bar. She should have used that one for the other wives. Maybe it wouldn't have worked as well. He was willing <laughs> to give up his bar, but not his teen brides. Um, didn't Brigham Young do a group of pioneers dirty because he was more concerned with his alcohol business than their well-being? I don't remember I have, the specifics. I've that. heard that. I, have, I haven't verified it through historical sources, so if please anyone take knows, this with a grain of salt. But I have comments. heard that um, in the famous <clears throat> Willie and Martin handcart expeditions where Brigham Young got up and said, we have to go get the saints that are out on the plains and save them. His actual first item of business was to send a, a squad out to retrieve his liquor stores mm. before rescuing the saints. Beautiful. Because he was making a shit ton of money in Utah at the time, Brigham Young had his fingers in literally every single business going on in Utah at the time became very rich, very fast. And uh, an interesting connection that I found here was, uh, so on the one hand, him and his right-hand man, Heber C. Kimball, are saying that no righteous member of the church should set up a distillery in this valley. Now, is it because he didn't want people drinking or because he didn't want the competition? Because he himself was operating Mm -hmm. a distillery. And when he eventually sold out to the city of Salt Lake, um... They continued to buy booze from him at like way higher the rate. Like uh, they could buy it for like a dollar fifty a mm. um, unit or whatever, and he was selling it to them for four dollars a unit. So the man, uh, <laughs> yeah, he was uh, the original Utah girl boss for Seriously, sure. Seriously, <laughs> thinking that, and honestly, it all checks out with what we know about Brigham Young, doesn't it? Yes. So going back through the word of wisdom. Um, so we have no wine, uh, and I was saying about the wine that it is a heart opener. And when you like, when I drink wine, I get very sentimental. And oh, you yeah. can see how someone in a religious, as a religious sacrament, which seems like a very responsible and high intentional usage of wine, yeah. as a way of like trying to connect with your highest sense of self and with the community around you, it seems very wholesome and very and not sad. Drinking much, yeah. A little polyphenols, yeah. A few antioxidants, yeah. So he says, strong drinks are not for the belly, but for the washing of your body, something that Joseph Smith took to heart and initially bathed uh, the temple patrons in whiskey, uh, like to give them the full body whiskey rub down. <laughs> Wholesome herbs, God hath ordained for the use of man. Um, it says every every all wholesome herbs. So every I guess that would include cannabis. Yeah. Strong case to be made Does, there. Is cannabis a herb or just a plant? 
What's the difference? They just got abused with Thanksgiving, and that one will give you a lot of Thanksgiving. Flesh also of beasts and of the fowls of the air, I, the Lord, have ordained for the use of man with thanksgiving. Nevertheless, they are to be used sparingly, and it is pleasing unto me that they should not be used, only in times of winter or of cold or of famine. Hmm. Maybe if they would have stuck to that, the Great Salt Lake wouldn't be drying up quite so much. Yeah. So it's interesting to see these changing attitudes um, about various substances <clears throat> throughout the church's history, depending on who's in office at the time and what is going on politically and socially at the time, because, of course, that always has a huge influence, even though Mormons don't want to acknowledge it. So there was a lot of conflict of interest going on at Utah, in Utah, with Prohibition, with various political factions who are trying to gain uh, control of the liquor sales, and then the you know Mormon community that's trying to keep an economic foothold in the area that is, thinks it's easier to just get rid of those people, and then also, like bringing uh, Reed Smoot into the Senate and trying to build up a multi-faith coalition to back him, which mm. also included temperance and yada yada. It's all very complex, even though they try to make it very black and white. I think Lorenzo Snow was the only prophet who ever really emphasized the meat thing. But it's just interesting that arbitrary things like tea and coffee, which have not only been shown to not be excessively harmful, but to actually be quite helpful... <clears throat> Um, You see such a huge emphasis on that to the point where Joseph Fielding Smith is saying you can't go to the celestial kingdom if you're partaking of these substances or Julie B. Beck, who uh, as recent as, what was that, like 10 years ago, maybe even less, said like that drinking a cup of coffee could keep you out of the celestial kingdom, could keep you away from your family. As recently as a few years ago, we heard some talk about that. Yeah, but you never hear that about me. You don't. And it's so arbitrary and hypocritical because it's... It's just as clear. The meat thing is just as clear as the hot drink thing. More clear because it says meat and it doesn't say coffee or tea. And Mormons drink hot chocolate all the time. And it says of winter or of cold or of famine. But it also says it's pleasing unto me that they should not be used. Like really modern revelation you would imagine would make it so that now it actually doesn't need to be used at all. Because when it's winter or cold here, we're not starving in any way. Like our crops aren't low. We can get any food we want. Also, we know that plant-based eating has all these benefits for the local and global environment. So it's so hypocritical. Also, just for anyone who doesn't know, caffeine is one of the most... Actually, I think caffeine is the most researched substance on the planet. I was watching this nutritionist video the other day. Or if not... It might be one of, um, so don't quote me on the single most. But what we know about, I mean, everyone has sort of a different genetic tolerance for for caffeine. Um, I did the 23andMe test and it said I have a high tolerance, so I'm likely to consume more caffeine than the average person. Fun fact. Um, But the the health benefits of coffee peak at around five to six cups a day. So they this idea that you know was that like 500 milligrams or something of caffeine. Uh, I think the safe caffeine is seen as like 200 to 300 a day. I'm not, I'm not certain on the exact caffeine, but the, I know that the health benefits of coffee, according to the research, five to six cups is kind of the sweet spot where you get like the maximum benefits in the widest range of diseases. <laughs> if I drink five cups of coffee today. Well, <laughs> it isn't five, you know, full mugs like this. I don't think, I think it's more of, you know, what, Actual. what a European might consider a cup of coffee, a smaller amount. Um, again, don't quote me on that. Look into all of this. But all I'm trying to say is that... W- Except for, if, you know, if obviously people feel that caffeine affects their body in a way they don't like or they they don't like feeling sort of dependent on it because it obviously does, you do get sort of addicted to it and your body builds up a tolerance. Um, so, I mean, those are valid reasons to cut back, I suppose. But if you're not concerned with that, which I'm not, then you really don't need to be worried about cutting back on coffee for your health. It's not bad for you. <laughs> yeah, It has a lot of antioxidants. It has a lot of disease-fighting benefits and... Tea as well. Lots of, you know, cultures that have a strong tea culture have been shown to have, like, lower rates of various things. I mean, nutrition is always, like, hard to pass through what's what, you know. But Mm -hmm. moral of the story is coffee and tea both have health benefits. That's so crazy because I have so many quotes from Mormon general authorities saying that people who drink coffee and tea are just plagued and riddled with so many health problems. Is this a church thing? No, this is actually just uh, some coffee research saying that it has been shown to increase long life longevity, which is something mm-hmm. Mormons are always talking about. Like, we're so healthy, we live longer than the average American. It's like, well, maybe if you had a little coffee, you could even boost your numbers. Also, maybe that was true back in the day, but is it true now? 
I, I wonder. Know. It seems the sugar intake. Because the sugar intake really is high. Which is why they should drink coffee, because it actually helps yeah. better process sugar and glucose. Um, you're less likely to develop heart failure. You are less likely to develop Parkinson's disease. It's good for your liver. I actually know a Mormon who was prescribed coffee by a doctor for their liver. Did they take it? Yep. And they do it every day like medicine. Like that God. could have been a great enzyme <laughs> article if they refused to take it. Yeah, right. <laughs> like Joseph Smith. No, Dad, I no! just need you to hold me. <laughs> Um, good for your DNA, has a huge benefit in preventing colon cancer, um, also reduces your risk of getting Alzheimer's, something that oh, I personally yeah, am concerned with. My one. grandfather died of dementia. There's like so many benefits to it that it's so silly to be like, this is just the thing that I have to obey that separates me from the wicked people. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, if this were actually about <clears throat> health... You should be able to be like, okay, maybe I should cut back on sugar, actually, something that's not mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I should cut back on the meat, something that is mentioned. And maybe I should drink some coffee, something that isn't mentioned that Mormons forbid. <laughs> and meat is, depending on the meat, classed as a class one or class two carcinogen by the World Health Organization. I think it's um, processed red meat is a class one carcinogen and then... Uh, I don't know, look it up, but, but it, we know that meat, most of the meat that, the, you know, the average Mormon is consuming, because I think maybe, you know, if you go grass-fed, super high quality, I think some of those risks go down, but the, the meat that the average Mormon is consuming is carcinogenic. Well, uh, again, there's a conflict of interest here, because guess who is one of the largest cattle ranching landowners in the United States? Mm. The LDS Church. Beautiful. Bad business. To <laughs> the thing I did want to say about coffee is the word addiction comes into a lot. Like in the comments, we get people who are like, I'm just glad I'm not addicted to coffee. And you can make fun of me, but at least I'm not addicted. And it's, there needs some nuance there because uh, addiction, if we're talking about like a chemical dependence, you can't pr properly be addicted to caffeine. You could be compulsive. You could use more than what your body may feel comfortable with. And the worst that could happen you is you get extremely yeah. jittery. And then, you know, if you, if you keep that pace up and then go a few days without, you could get like a bad headache, a headache and yeah. feel anxious or but something. You're not going to die from coffee withdrawals. You're not. So I was listening to the Andrew Huberman lab episode about this this morning. Thank God. And, <laughs> and he makes an interesting point about caffeine. Um, he mentions that window of like, this is probably the healthy amount that you should drink. But an interesting thing about coffee versus, um, and caffeine, caffeine specifically, versus other substances and experiences um, which release dopamine like... So many things. You're watching this right now, you're probably getting a little dopamine from Definitely. it. Um, smoking a cigarette will give you a dopamine boost. Uh, smoking cannabis will give you a dopamine boost. And the reason that those things can be um, compulsive is that they can, in time, deplete your dopamine and then not mm -hmm. give you a way to replenish, mm -hmm. leaving you afterward feeling worse off than before you did well, it. And that's that definitely the down. case with alcohol, where after... After you drink even a little amount, you experience higher cortisol levels later when you're sober. Mm -hmm. Coffee, on the other hand, is one of the few things that replenishes dopamine stores and in that way becomes anti-addictive mm. in that it helps you recover from the things which are draining you of dopamine. Oh, interesting. So used wisely can actually be a great benefit. And of course, we already listed all the other uh, phenomenal benefits of drinking coffee. And getting back to the Mormon thing, again, it's just so silly to have such a hard line stance on this that is so disconnected from practicality, mm -hmm. which was the initial spirit of the law, as it were, that now is just this test of obedience, this like, I'm just going to do it. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to yeah. add up. I'm just going to do it because it's what makes me a good person and I'm righteous and obedient and I'm going to heaven and you're not. Like, I, Yeah, I mean, I think that's where it gets really problematic. And also, I mean, I can see the argument for a, a spiritual community kind of being anti-alcohol. I think that's valid. But I also think it should still be up to the... I don't think your membership in the community should be determined by whether you adhere to that. I think it, you know, it's fine for a community to maybe teach about the dangers of alcohol and say that, you know, we recommend not drinking alcohol because abstinence can be often better than moderation or easier. Mm -hmm. But I just think to, to tie it to morality so much 
is just not good. And it just creates like a bigoted environment. Yes. And it's just unnecessary. And it, it's, it's like such a classic telltale sign of a high control group, right? Because it's like, why do they have to be so involved? Mm-hmm. It's like you can, you can teach things without requiring people to adhere to them. Mm-hmm. And especially when so many leaders of the church have used, and Jesus himself, hey. Bernard, and Jesus really? himself, yeah. Joseph Smith himself, all use these things. There's a story about Joseph Smith preaching about the word of wisdom and then riding off on a horse smoking a cigar. And so then to have such a hardline stance and to re- to edit the history, to wipe, off, wipe out yeah. any trace of that being done, and it's just... Silly. And to to your point of like a religious community saying, I think it's one thing to be like, we don't want you to drink alcohol here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then to be like, you're not, even if you do it in your house, then you are stepping into Satan's territory. Mm-hmm. You're going to be tempted. This is the steady, some apostles said, this is the steady fall to apostasy. You know, they start having a drink and next thing you know, they're criticizing us. <laughs> even having sort of a hardline stance as a religious community on meat makes more sense to me than alcohol because with meat, it's like other beings are implicated in your decision and with alcohol while obviously alcohol can lead to people you know doing things that harm others that's not like inherently the case Mm -hmm. so it is such a personal thing and it's like a thing that you know again unless you're shitty to others when you drink I suppose only affects you and it's a choice you make about your body well I don't know what he wants there's nothing he wants you can't please him (laughs) he's just running around like a little terrorist even meat would make more sense as sort of a Temple recommend question, potentially. If you're a community that really believes... I mean, Mormons don't care about animal ethics, right? But if mm. you did care about animal rights as a community, I could see it being making sense to be like, we want our community members to not eat meat. Mm. Which is crazy that there isn't more... I mean, it's not because, again, Mormonism is just the McDonald's of religion. Mm-hmm. It, but like, if they actually believed what they preach, which is that animals have spirits mm-hmm. and that we are supposed to be stewards of the earth, like... Don't you think that we should be trying to like t- reduce as much harm as possible from? And if you're gonna see those spirits in the hereafter, you're gonna be like, walk up to a cow and it's gonna be like, hey, thanks for letting me live in a factory farm my whole life so that you could eat me for dinner, douchebag. In like excessive amounts that we know are harmful. <laughs> That's another thing. Even if you make the argument that you know the highest quality meat doesn't have to be bad for you. It, the, the quantity that most Western people eat meat in is, is so high, much higher than, you know, what we ideally would. I hear Mormons say that eating meat sparingly means you should only eat it like twice a day. <laughs> Just like the World Health Organization says. <laughs> Imagine if that was my alcohol consumption. Uh, oh, just two cups a day for just moderation. <laughs> yeah. Which could actually be seen as somewhat moderate in some cultures. I mean, two beers a day versus two servings of bacon. I, I truly don't know what's worse. They're both in the same category, I think, of carcinogen. Going back to, you know, the the mindset that Mormons have of, well, we don't have to understand the why. Because, you know, modern Mormons are aware that coffee and tea isn't bad for you, I think, mm-hmm. generally, right? To them, it's just like a, a blind obedience test. Like, I don't, ha- it doesn't have to make sense. Yeah. I'm just doing it because God. And then someday we'll be vindicated. Yeah. Just like how nobody ever knew tobacco smoking was bad, and now they do. Again, they knew that since, like... I mean, hundreds and hundreds of years it seems like if they're going to change sort of the way that they adhere to the word wisdom over time, it should be in, in accordance with how science is changing. That's just my personal perspective. But I think, it, again, it is troubling that because most reasonable Mormons know that coffee is better than drinking an energy drink, but an energy drink is fine. Or coffee is better than drinking a Diet Coke, but they'll drink Diet Coke. Like a lot of modern Mormons are aware of that logic but they take the they take the stance of well it's a test of faith it's a test of obedience and obedience is the first law of heaven is mm-hmm. it and that's where it really gets problematic because i think any time an organization is asking people to do things that sort of defy reason just in the name of obedience and then telling them that that will bring them blessings i mean that is a high control group right i think any time you're you know you're asked to just blindly adhere to something arbitrarily I mean, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's mm. no... What's the benefit here? Impossible The benefit me. is that the group <laughs> has more control over you. You're more psychologically dependent on the group. It makes sense. As we've said, every... You know, 
Muslims don't eat... What do they not eat? Pork? They don't eat pork. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarian. Um, uh, there's so Orthodox many examples. Orthodox Jews don't mix various um, food and clothing items like cotton and some mm-hmm. other thing. So much so that the more Orthodox people will have two kitchens Whoa. that they can prepare different parts Whoa. of the meal in. And it's like... Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not a widespread for everybody who is of Jewish heritage, but yeah, it's just interesting to see how people of any culture can take a thing like just some sensible a principle of moderation and then become so uh, rigid and superfluous about it, mm-hmm. creating rules upon rules upon rules that totally stray away from the initial intent, which was just, hey, try mm-hmm. to be healthy. Yeah, like, I mean, I suppose it probably made sense to not eat shellfish in biblical times, because that does seem like a bit of a recipe for disaster food poisoning-wise, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm just guessing where that would have come from. What about other hoofed animals? (laughs) Was that in the Bible, too? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Another use for tobacco um, has been shown with uh, people who have schizophrenia. Really? Uh, in reducing the effects because you know you think about tobacco it kind of gives you that like mm. grounded bubble yeah. feeling interesting whereas a you know a schizophrenic or psychotic person is so expansive mm. in their mindscape it can help just bring them in a little bit which is why so many uh, schizoaffective people are also smokers mm. and you know a religious person might be like that's your problem is you're addicted and it's like well that thing is actually probably helping them Whoa. in a way that of course I'm not advocating for the you, you, you know if you have something like that, it's best to see a doctor and plan a medication strategy with them. But just interesting. Yeah. Which Um, is why tobacco gets used medicinally and sacramentally in a lot of uh, shamanic cultures mm. that are being paired with other psychedelic, psychoactive drugs. Mm. Just interesting. So we just started reading this book, Stephanie, on our Patreon, and it was written in 1989. So it's a really good look at sort of Oh, and the book is about a teen girl who is addicted to drugs and alcohol, basically Mm -hmm. addicted to everything. Um, So it's a great look at sort of Mormon attitudes to addiction and to substances in the 80s and also what they perceived as being the cause of addiction and what helps addiction, which of course is Christ. More specifically, his church. (laughs) Well, something that reading the first chapter really highlighted to me is just how much Mormons love the idea of just sort of being different enough that it inspires people to ask questions about the church. I think they have this idea that, you know, because we live a superior moral code, aka we don't drink alcohol, for example, or we don't drink coffee, which everyone drinks, that makes us peculiar, which makes people interested, which is going to have people convert, which is what we're seeing play out in the first chapter of this book, which feels totally unrealistic. But it does show the sort of Mormon superiority complex that the word of wisdom is all wrapped up in a lot of the time. We at BYU Idaho, there was that apostle that came and said, avoid the appearance of evil by ordering milk at a bar. If you have to go to a bar for a business Psychopath meeting. behavior, Psychopath Elton behavior. Perry. <laughs> also milk. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and then you also see at BYU Idaho, um, again, this like pharisaical approach to the word of wisdom, which is, well, if coffee is bad presumably for the for the caffeine even though that's never been disclosed and we can drink caffeine in other forms that aren't hot because hot drinks are forbidden but hot chocolate is also okay even though it's also caffeinated and hot but then they say okay well now we can't even drink cola drinks and i there was a quote i was looking at earlier where he was like if we assume these are bad then we must assume also that cola drinks and it's like yeah exactly it's like well then we must assume a lot of things that are never explicitly mentioned and make up many rules for ourselves that we can use to judge ourselves and others and again it just always strays so far from what would be useful because it's not the caffeine that makes coke bad like a fanta is going to be just as bad for you it's like the obscene sugar content (laughs) but again that gets missed because you're just so focused on the arbitrary which is the thing we talk about a lot with mormonism you're so focused on arbitrary stuff that you just you miss the forest for the trees and again just can't be overstated the belief that this type of thing that having a glass of wine with dinner or a cup of coffee in the morning is an egregious enough of a sin to keep you out of the presence of God forever, to keep you shut off from your, cut off from your eternal family, uh, you're un- unworthy to en- enter the house of the Lord. Because God is authoritarian. And that is 
but not what consistent. What can be <laughs> spooky about these high demand groups is they encourage an authoritarian structure, you know, in the religion, and then that does impact how people act politically, like how they vote, how they view different regimes, which mm-hmm. is, you know, there's knock on effects to this. And also, it's worth mentioning that I think one of the reasons groups like Mormonism ban pretty much anything that gives you a, a high, a buzz, a feel good is because they want to have them be the primary source of relief for you and the the thing that you go to to seek comfort and you know they'd obviously rather you be doing something that increases your loyalty to them than having a glass of wine with a a non-member friend you know and also by having these more peculiar standards around food and drink I suppose mostly drink at this point it also does keep you somewhat isolated because like coffee and tea culture in a lot of countries around the world is huge and if you don't participate in that mm, you know it's just a way of keeping everyone in the group more together and having I would say less associations with people outside the group because you're less likely to go to a bar you're less likely to maybe even go to a dinner where all your friends are drinking wine so just having these weird standards just like serves to make the community more insular yes and perfect point in the context of uh Addiction. I think Dr. Huberman, who, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Andrew Huberman is, is our a, daddy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a, neurobiolo- a neurobiologist at Stanford who does a great job of breaking down the research on various subjects and uh, putting it into accessible layman's terms. And promoting athletic greens. <laughs> and promoting He's athletic- not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but he talks about addiction as, as anything that seeks to become the soul, our sole source of. Uh, dopaminetic release Mm. and so that is exactly what Mm -hmm. religions like mormonism are in effect doing trying to make participation in that the Mm -hmm. sole source of joy for people by cutting out anything else and people's ability to connect with out out group members yeah so they can be the the one and only you talk a lot about how on your mission you know, everything sort of resembling normal life was taken away from you. So it created such psychological tension that you were desperate to find any relief in any like shred of Mormonism, you know, yeah. yeah, insider connection. Yeah. All very interesting. So, I mean, you can say the reason Mormons don't drink coffee or tea is because, well, you could either make the case for they don't want to be addicted to anything, but I feel like that doesn't really hold much weight Absolutely as an argument not. because Mormons are addicted to sugar a lot of the time. You know, a sugar addiction, a caffeine... Um, and they'll know. pop they'll pop uh, pills of, of all kinds. Mormons will have less hesitation about taking opioids than they will about no a wonder, cup of coffee. No wonder, because if you've never had any kind of substance that can provide sort of, you know, a glass of wine, let's be honest here, can relax you and can, like, alleviate stress in Just a way like- that feels very <laughs> nice. And if you've never had an experience of that, you've only had, like, sugar, which can kind of get you hyper... Then the first time you try opioids because you had a wisdom tooth out, I feel like it's going to potentially seem more appealing than it would to someone like me who's like, I've never found opioids like that big of a deal one way or the other, but I wonder, you know, I feel like if you're used to having other substances, they're not going to stick out as like, whoa, this holy grail thing that is like, technically I'm allowed it. And if I could just keep going to my doctor, you know, it's tough. (laughs) Well, when I was a Mormon and got my appendix out at the LDS hospital... I woke up from <laughs> the euthanasia and was like, I want to do this every weekend. Let me take my appendix out every weekend. Bless you. So anyway, you can't options. really make the argument that it's about addiction. So I really feel like the truest, the truest reasoning that LDS people don't drink coffee is because they believe in blind obedience to authority. And like you said, that quote that obedience is the first principle of heaven, I think so is disturbing. the most anti i mean because mormons will also claim that they believe in agency so much so that there was a great war in heaven and people had to leave because they didn't want agency and it's like you actually don't believe in agency the first obedience is the first law of heaven what are you talking about like that's the first law of nazism of fascism like just saying you have to obey no matter what regardless of the reasons regardless of the ethics even when evidence contradicts it being a good idea blind obedience is not a virtue No, that's how, like, every atrocity throughout history has happened. Yes. Blind obedience. Yes. But it's fine when they do it. It's just like with marrying kids. It's like, generally, that's not good. But when we do it, it's different. I That was a hilarious part of all this, like, because, you know, getting into, like, Joseph uh, F. Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith and some of the ones who were, like, really hardline 
about this issue. Marrying kids. Also were marrying kids at the time and lying to the federal government about it. Like mm-hmm. uh, Joseph Fielding Smith did a, you know, talked about this in a really hardliner way while just before the second manifesto was issued. You know, there's just so much going mm-hmm. on. And this just becomes, I think, like you were saying earlier, a way of just very easily and quickly maintaining control by d- making people uh, not be able to participate in wider mm-hmm. social functions. And outside of not participating, it's... Uh, it, it, creates us versus them mentalities because a lot of Mormons are judgmental towards people that don't follow the word of wisdom, even though they're not Mormon. And and that's not universal because I've definitely met Mormons that won't judge a non-Mormon for having a beer, you know, mm-hmm. and, or coffee. But I'd say probably the further back you go, the more it was sort of reinforced as being a thing that related to your virtue and to your righteousness so you just become more bigoted generally and more judgmental of everyone who wasn't in your group. Ideal. <laughs> um, if you want to keep diving into this topic through the lens of 80s Mormon fiction with us, <laughs> join us on Patreon, support our channel there. You can pledge any amount and you get access to our whole Stephanie series, which we just started. Episode one just went live today. We had a blast reading it. I just can't emphasize how this is a lot of just straightforward discourse. Yeah. And that is a lot of lols. So it's much a lot more of fun approach. And <laughs> it's really showing how all these teachings and how Mormon culture around substances plays out. Even though the writing is not realistic, but it sort of is in the same, you know. Especially <laughs> in see. Reagan era Utah. <laughs> the war on drugs is in full effect. If you want to buy a Zelf on the Shelf mug, head to our merch store, which is linked below. We have ones with our logo and we don't just have these uh, Patreon inspired ones. I'm going to be rolling out some more soon. So. And Tamara's going to be rolling out some more any day now, so. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy. All things in moderation. Except this channel. Watch it every second that you have available. I love you. Bye.